Stand with me, please. Ephesians chapter 5. We're talking about marriage in the home again this morning. And Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forth, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it might be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Heavenly Father, thank you for marriage. Thank you how you set it up. We know that you don't make mistakes. Lord, we are sorry that America is trying to change that definition. And by subtle law of the land now, we're told that it's not anything like what you ordained in your word. God, I hope that that breaks the hearts of millions of Americans. In church or out of church, we recognize that that's just not right. I pray that we'd know our Bible, we'd not be discouraged. We know that through the power of the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit, we know that greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. Lord, at times we've lost some battles, but we know that we will not lose the war. Help us never to forget that. Lord, help us to celebrate marriage today, the truth of it, the joy of it. and Help us, if we are married, to be better husbands and better wives. Watch over us, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Last week we talked about the influence of Satan on society. As we're giving the invitation, the, the elevator alarm started going off. We had a uh, sump pump under the elevator. was not working properly. It had never needed to work before. We found that this on last Monday there was a drain plugged out in the woods that's supposed to be draining the foundation. Isn't it so coincidental that right at the invitation that an alarm starts going off? And uh, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. But anyway, that's what happened last week, and uh, you know, you take your shots at Satan, he's going to take his shots back at you. But I'll tell you, anyway, so this week we've had some disturbing news. We know that marriage was ordained by God. The Bible starts with the marriage and ends with the marriage. I want to say some things that I'm uncomfortable with talking about, but it doesn't seem like the world's too uncomfortable with talking about it. But the reality of it is is that history has shown for thousands of years nations only survive when they recognize the role of the family. Men, women, children, husbands, wives. No nation has ever survived that has recognized or honored a homosexual lifestyle. It, It has not worked. There's no place in history we can show that it has. For obviously this, church is over, this uh, country is over 200 years old now, and now they've decided this week that I guess for all time since this country was established that we were just plain wrong. But there are 79 countries in the world right now that have sodomy laws on the books. The United States used to have those until 2003, just 12 years ago, the, the uh, Supreme Court decided that those laws were unconstitutional. So they're no longer prosecuted, and the fact is they weren't prosecuted really before that. We were told that what goes on in behind closed doors in the homes of people is none of our business, to stay out of it. And so obviously, being caring, loving people, we have stayed out of that. And obviously, we have stood for what's right, and we've talked about it. Now they have come out of their houses, come out of the closet, if you will, and they're marching down our streets, holding up their colorful banners, and talking about a gay lifestyle, that gay is just another robbery of a word, that gay has nothing to do with it. It's not a happy lifestyle, it's a death style. You live a shorter life if you choose that lifestyle versus what God set up. They've marched down our streets, and now they've walked into our businesses and told us if we don't honor them and do what they ask, they will put us out of business. 
and they've had a certain amount of success in doing that. Now they're going to walk out of our businesses, and after this, uh, this decision by the Supreme Court, they will be marching into our churches and telling us to get into the closet and shut up and don't talk about it. And that's where we are headed. And I want you to know that you just need to be prepared for what's coming because they're not happy now. They're not happy with that victory because the reality of it is marriage is not what they're after. They're after the church. They're after the word of God. They're after silencing you and I. Don't miss this. Don't be deceived that you think, okay, finally they got what they're looking for. No, this is not what they're looking for. Their venom is not against you and I. Their venom is against God Almighty. And they're trying to shut God up. And you and I are the spokesmen for the word of God. And we will not be shut up. We will not be quieted. And we have to continue to stand for what we know is right. And so they won't be happy with that victory. So you can say, well, Stan, how are we supposed to stand at this point? This isn't the point of my message, but I just want to throw this out to you very quickly. How do we stand? Well, number one, you want to stand on the authority of the Word of God without apology. We will not back off from God's Word. Okay. Number two, inform yourself of the battles we are fighting and be prepared to engage others with informed and knowledgeable answers. Kill them with kindness, number one. Do not be nasty, do not be in your face, but if someone truly wants to talk to you about what we believe, we'll be glad to ask them, be glad to talk to them, and if you sense that they're being somewhat nasty about it, then ask them this, when was the last time you were ever truly happy? When was the last time you ever experienced joy? Tell me the last time you were truly content and be honest, and if they'll be honest, they've never experienced that, because they'll never be happy. All right, just so be prepared to engage them in a loving way because we're not wrong here. And they'll start shooting at us and they'll start taking knocks at me as the pastor of this church and they'll start saying things. And just remember, when they start criticizing the messenger, then they've lost the battle. So don't take that personally, but be prepared to engage them. And lastly, I love this one, just live well, be happy because they will never be happy no matter what they get and we'll not be stopping being happy because we were happy before we're happy now and we'll be happy tomorrow and when they see us enjoying our life they're going to have to admit to themselves behind closed doors you know what they have something that we don't have and we want them to have it and by the power of god in the holy spirit the church is a force they cannot stop so don't feel like we have no power we have all the power and uh, don't be afraid to use that so that's where we're at but this morning we're talking about marriage and the family and uh, last Sunday I touched on something you know uh, you know that a lot of t- a lot of my speaking a lot of preachers have notes and they go by their notes and I do some want but a lot of the stuff I say is extemporaneous and then after I've said it it wasn't in my notes I throw things out to you and after I said it, I thought you know that's not exactly correct or that's not true and I know I'm going to take heat for that and I didn't but sometimes um, if you judge yourself you don't need to be judged so in judging myself last week I talked about the difference between men and women and uh, there's three things they are different each one needs to be studied and great homes build great churches now understanding how something works makes it easier when something goes wrong. For instance, if you're going down the road and there's a light flashing on your dash that says you're low on gas and you run out of gas, you don't have anyone to blame but yourself and you're not wondering what happened to the car. You know you ran out of gas. How do you know that? Because you're familiar with how they work. You're not going to call AAA and say, I don't understand why my car's not running and they call the mechanic and they come out and they say, well, you're out of gas. You know that. You can't change that. Um, If you're Whatever, there are things in life you and I, we don't have to ask any questions on. However, when it comes to relationships, there are folks that sit behind desks getting better than a buck an hour to listen to you talk about your situation so that someone can analyze it. And there are some basic truths about men and women that if you understand just the foundational truths about them, then when things happen, it'll make more sense to you. You follow me? Now, folks hire me to look at their furnace. A furnace to me is not a mystery, but it is to someone that doesn't know anything about them. 
And sad to say, when it comes to relationships, you and I are built in the image of God. We are built for relationships. We ought to be a little better at it about what we're doing so that when something happens, when, when the relationship starts to fall off the wheels, it'll be just as obvious to us as your vehicle running out of gas, you'll understand what's going on. So I'm going to give you some foundational truths this morning that will explain to you some of the differences between men and women, because I want you to know men and women are different, okay? I know this is a revelation. Let's say that with me. Men and women are different. Okay, now I know, what was it, Time Magazine, not long ago, came out with a front page cover that they decided that men and women are different. <gasps> what a, what a, what a, a ghastly thing to find out. But I'll tell you, for a long time, they're trying to make us the same, only different parts. Well, they're not. Number one, they are different. This is where I felt like I made a mistake in the message last week or spoke when I did, shouldn't have, is when I said that men have fewer words than women. You come home from work, guys. She launches into the words that she has, trying to use up what she hasn't used yet, and I said, nag, 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 nag. That is not true. That is not right. And I want to say that my, I'm going to say three words that my wife says I never say. <laughs> That is, I am sorry. Now, don't ask me to repeat that. Okay, so, <laughs> so here we are. And here is the actual, this is, this is the truth, okay? Number one, men have 12,500 words a day. On an average, women have 25,000. That's a difference, okay? Now, we know it's true. Guys will go to work. Now, if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're home with the kids, you don't have a lot, a lot of meaningful way to use up your your extra words, okay? So you're home with the kids and they're doing all their things and maybe the height of your conversation is, you know, Sally, stop doing that. Stop it. Well, that's only two words. You could say those two words all day. Stop it. Stop it. You know? But the reality of it is when your husband comes home, you're thinking, aha, adult conversation. And here we go. You know? What has happened? Well, the guy's been at work all day. He's having an adult conversation. He doesn't run a daycare. He works for General Motors or wherever. And they're talking. He's using up his 12,500 words. When he gets home, he has no words to say. They're used up. <laughs> How was your work today, dear? Fine. That's all it is. There's that, there's all, he's done. And she wants to know all of these things. And as she's talking, you're not listening. You've moved on. That happens, okay? It starts, this isn't, listen, I'm, that's just the beginning. It starts early. Researchers have found that little girls talk more than little boys. Even in the nursery hospital, you know, we've all stopped by to look through the window at the nursery. They've noticed that there's more lip movement on girls than there is on boys. <laughs> A Harvard preschool program wired a playground for sounds. Uh, this is preschool now. They wired the playground for sound. 100% of the communication from girls was understandable as they talked to each other. They got words early. Three years old, they can talk about all the things they want to. For boys, only 68% of the words were actual words. The rest of them, the other percentage was just <laughs> My son Cody has a language all his own, and he's looking at you talking just as serious as the day is long, and he's very frustrated that you're not getting what he's saying, but he wants us to learn his language. He's not interested in learning ours. <laughs> That's all it is. Why? Because he's a boy, okay? There's a huge difference between the way a boy, the experience that a boy has in the womb of the mother versus the girl, okay? Now, don't miss this. Medical research has shown that between the 18th and 26th week of gestation, a boy's brain goes through a chemical bath that makes the boy's right side of the brain slightly recede and breaks down the fibrous tissue called the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. The change that makes the male baby more left brain dominant than the female. The result is that females are much more in touch with their feelings and think more with both sides of their brain than a boy does, analytically. Now, let me explain this to you. We've got, you know, the hemispheres of your brain. A boy in mom's, in the womb, goes through this chemical change that, obviously, God does all this. Their, the right side of their brain starts to recede. It disconnects some of the connective tissue between the two hemispheres, 
and it makes a boy more left brain dominant, analytical, logical, sane, okay? <laughs> oh. Now, ladies, if you want to hear, if you want to hear the, the ladies' side of this, go to a women's conference somewhere, but I'm the one preaching here, okay? Now, Having said that, though, now this is, now honestly, this is, now I'll shoot myself in the foot. Literally, boys are born somewhat brain damaged, okay? <laughs> Ladies, on the other hand, God does this. Don't, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. Women do not experience this same chemical bath that boys do. Their brains are completely connected, left, right. They think globally. They're in touch with their emotions, their feelings. Everything's going on there. Men are more analytical. For instance, we can go, I started hunting early in life. Dad likes to hunt. I like to hunt. I wanted to be like my father. Dad's out killing things. I wanted to go kill things. Give me a gun. So we'd go off in the woods. We'd see a deer. Now, a girl would see Bambri or you think, and think, oh, isn't that lovely? We're thinking, target, shoot. We kill it. We drag it home. What's the woman think? Oh, I wonder if that hurt. I wonder if it experienced any pain. I wonder if it thought about its mother just before. It All of that stuff. It never crossed our mind. And then what happens? These girls, they start thinking these things. And the guy wanting to impress the girl starts thinking about these things too. And they're trying to chickify men in the world. And that's not a good thing. Okay? Now, when... When, <laughs> listen, this is, this is what happens though. And so when women have more influence on men, men can be in touch with their feelings. It all depends on what part of their life is pushed. It's not a natural thing to, for a guy to be in touch with his feelings, but on the other hand, if he's around a lot of women, raised by mom, for instance, that can be his mindset. He can start thinking about those things, but that's not natural for a guy. The natural thing for a guy is to be analytical, a conqueror, go and get things, grab them, I got it, kill it, put it on the wall, I win. That's a guy, okay? On the other hand, if you want a woman to sit there and watch football with you, now football's a guy's sport. We got men running full speed, hitting each other in the middle of the field, going down, bringing out stretchers, taking them back. You know, this one broke his neck, he'll never walk again. Well, did he win the game? That's all we want to know about, okay? Now, when that stuff happens, that's a guy's thing. Women are looking at that. You know, we want, we want some together time. We want, to, we want to bond. We want to get together. We say, well, yeah, we'll bond. Hey, let's watch some football. Sit down here with me. Let's do that. They don't want to do that. Why is that? The only way you can get a woman to watch football is you need to study and find out about the guy's girlfriends, their wives, they have kids, this one fighting an illness or whatever that. And then, when, then, then they'll sit down and this quarterback gets sacked. Oh, look what they did to Katie's husband. That's what they'll be saying. <laughs> But at least they'll have some emotional connection to what's going on. Look, you're laughing because you know I'm right. You know it's true, okay? So it starts very early. God designed it to be this way. He couldn't have the whole world made up of men and women both thinking and acting alike. There's, there's, that'll, that'll never work. Sometimes it's the, in, in the irritation that change takes place. Pearls are created from an irritation in an oyster that a piece of sand will get in it. And if the sand is never there, nothing ever, take, nothing ever goes wrong. But if there's a piece of sand in that oyster, there is something that is released called the essence of pearl. And that goes into that oyster, and over a period of time, the essence of pearl, through that irritation, creates something very special. And God knew in his wisdom that if there was never any conflict, if there was never any problem, change would never take place, and think good things would never happen. And I think it's the Hilton Hotel years ago that came out with the philosophy that we have no problems, only opportunities. And listen, problems in your marriage is not a problem. It's an opportunity for you to look at each other and get to know one another and make adjustments that will make your marriage stronger and better, and pearls can take place. So here we are, obviously, there's a huge difference between the two. Number one, they are different. Number two, they need to be studied. Men, you need to be studied. 
Ladies, you need to be studied. We need to become experts on men and women. Now, I'm saying you don't need to be experts on all men and all women, but if you're married, you need to be expert on the one you live with. That's all that matters. All we're talking about, guys, we can do this. We can conquer one woman. We can do this, okay? Ladies, you can get in touch with one man. This isn't, we're not asking you to go out and reach the world, just the one you live with. That's all, or the one that you hope to be with. That's the one that you're going to study. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together with the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I was listening to a speaker this week. Maybe you heard it as well. I had never heard the guy before, and I only caught the one line, filled an hour riding together in the van. He says, study your wife. I thought, well, you know, I like that. I think that's right. And so another one mentioned that, that on another program, a guy said, you know, I noticed my wife appreciated it when I just sat and visited her while she put on her makeup. I thought, you know, that's probably pretty good. So whatever the deal is, wherever you can study them, whatever needs to be done, you want to become expert. Every relationship needs four things. And we're running out of time. I'll give you these things, and we'll have to pick up this on another time. Every relationship, number one, needs meaningful communication. Guys, grunting's not going to do it. This isn't going to happen. You know, they need save some words for your wife. Number two, they need security. That's both physical and emotional. Number one, nobody's touching my house. Guys, your wife ought to know that if I'm home, you are safe. There's just there's no chance someone's going to hurt you if I'm home. I got you covered. Women need to know that. But not only do they need emotional, uh, their couples need physical security, they need to have emotional security too. The phrase they need to know is, I will never leave you. Did you hear me? I will never leave you. Say that with me. I will never leave you. Now, for some, they're thinking rats. But for the most case, (laughs) that's good news. All right? Jesus said, I will never leave you. What a great comfort for the Christian to know that I am never alone. God is always with me. Well, you know what? Relationships, marriage is based on that relationship with Christ and the church where Jesus looked at the church and he said, I'll never leave you. Don't forget that. Meaningful communication, security. Emotional and romantic bonding time. My wife and I call it quality time. I'll tell you what. I notice we drift apart if we're not together. But if we're together, there's just something special about alone time. I'll, I'll confess to you, uh, our anniversary last year, I think we had Mark preach us something. We were trying to go away, uh, couldn't really get away. The nature of my life doesn't really matter, but I really couldn't get away. So we rented a hotel room in Bangor. Woohoo! We went to Bangor. How great a getaway is that? So we got a hotel room in Bangor. On Saturday night, we stayed there. Sunday morning, we're thinking, Okay, the kids are going to grab the kids, and they're, the, the, the A team is going to take the B team, and they're headed for church. That means the house is empty. <laughs> so we, we left Bangor. We came home as fast as we could when we know the coast was clear, and we got to be home alone. Now, you can say that's pathetic. It is, but at least we got to be together alone. Okay, I'm not, I don't miss, I don't want to get rid of my kids. I love my kids. They had great, it's nothing like that. But I'll tell you what, if you're never alone with your wife, guys, Ladies, if you're never alone with your husband, something needs to give. That needs to happen. Emotional and romantic bonding time, and then lastly, physical contact. You know, there's something about touch. And you know that I'm not a hugger. I'm not interested in hugging you. Don't come up to me after the service and say, that was a great message, preacher. I want to hug you. Forget it. It ain't happening, okay? (laughs) But it does... There is something, the Bible, that, that, that people have studied this, is something about human touch. Solitary confinement for prisoners is unbelievable. And I think one of the things is, is not only do they want to see someone, we're, there's something that goes on with touch. I, I don't understand it all, but I, I know it to be true. I'm not for whatever you can carry this off to in the wrong direction, but the reality of it is we need 12 meaningful touches a day. Now, I'm not saying, guys, don't walk up to your wife, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, gotcha. I'm, I'm not talking about that, but I will tell you this, is that there ought to be a touch. I'm a, I like to come up behind my wife and hug her from the back. 
I don't know why. I've always been that way. Guys, if you haven't done that, I would, re- I would encourage you to tell her you're coming w- before you do, okay? <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, you might want to whisper, I'm behind you and I'm going to hug you, okay? <laughs> All right, but otherwise they may know that may be a regular thing for you, but like before church this morning, I was just thinking, trying to keep track of, without her knowing, a natural touch from me with my wife, and I'm, I'm, I'm counting those things, and it isn't hard, it's very easy to get in 12 touches a day if you get to see each other at all. It's not, and, and, and obviously there are other things that we could talk about about that, but we've spent 20 minutes talking about the difference between men and women, relationship, things I will never leave you, and if you understand the difference between men and women, and there's a whole lot more we can talk about about that, when things start to come, the wheels start to come off the relationship, you could just do a little checklist and say, okay, what is it that we're missing that needs to be worked on and work on it? You only need to be expert with one person in your life, your husband or your wife, that's it. That's all it is. And when you do those things, I'm telling you, marriage is fantastic. Now, why am I talking about this? Because the world is destroying marriage. And why is that? Because you and our marriages sometimes are pathetic, and we're supposed to be the model. Why is it that Christians are going to the divorce rate so, is so pathetic? Now, it doesn't need to be, but the reality of it is, is the world is laughing at us, telling them that they've got the wrong idea on marriage when they're telling us, well, I'm just as happy as you guys are. Look how pathetic your marriages are. And it's sometimes it's pretty hard to contradict that. Satan hates marriage because it's a picture of Christ in the church. He's doing everything he can to destroy that. And I'll tell you what, at the Cornerstone Baptist Church, it's not our intention to let him. We're going to have families and homes and lives that are exemplary, but the pastor can't enforce that. It's you and you choosing to be so. And why not? Why? This is a great life. Marriage is fantastic. And I'll tell you this, if he can destroy the home, he'll destroy the church. Done. Done. We'll pick up more on this at another time. Next Sunday is God and Country. The following week, we'll talk about these things some more. But it's, it's time we realized that Christians need to have marriages second to none. And we can do that because God is in us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. Lord, relationships are what you're about. You gave your Son to restore a relationship that was lost. That tells me you would do anything to make relationships right. You've held nothing back from us. And Lord, it could be that there are folks here this morning that have never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Forgive my sins. Lord, at some point in their life, they need to pray that prayer and invite you in. And then they'll, they'll have that void filled that they knew they needed something and couldn't understand what they were missing. And their spirit would be born again. New life in Christ, abundant and free. Lord, I pray that right now, if there are folks here that have never done that, if they'd be willing to just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, please say those words. Forgive my sins. Help me to live for you. If they'd say those words, oh Lord, help them not to miss that opportunity. Then maybe on the way out, they'd take one of our green books that says, Now what? And they could just finger through that and realize that life in Christ is, is worth it. They can't go wrong. Lord, for us as Christians, I pray for husbands, I pray for wives, I pray for young people that want to be married. I pray for newlyweds. I pray for those that are single that knew what it was like to be married and their wife or husband has passed on and Lord, I pray for every person here that relationships would be their number one desire, most of all to be close to you, but to be used by you to be close to someone else so that the world can see that a life in Christ makes a difference. Lord, for some reason it seems like we've not sent out that message properly. Help us to do so. Lord, we all open the altar. Perhaps there's couples here this morning that need to come and pray together. They want you to be the center, that they want to be experts on one another, that whatever's missing in their relationship, they'd like to have restored. Perhaps there's someone that knows of a couple that's hurting and would just like to come and pray for them. 
Lord, most of all, I pray for those that have never asked you into their heart that right now they'd say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Bless this invitation, please. It won't be long. In Jesus' name, amen.